Welcome everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 10.2, and it's my great pleasure to actually welcome Rick Rocco Zedona, who is actually a PhD student in remote sensing here at the Unique Supercomputing Center and the University of Iceland, and also a member of our simulation and data lab remote sensing that he will also present. The topic of today will be building on the lecture 10, building on the practical lecture 10.1 that we had the last time. But Rocco will also repeat some of these crucial aspects. And I think from there, I would say, welcome, Rocco. Thank you very much for providing us with a very deep insight lecture here of distributed deep learning. Go ahead. Thank you, Maurice, for the introduction. Hi, all. So uh, basically today, uh, my lecture will be this practical lecture 10.2 uh, on the topic of distributed deep learning, which is a topic I've been working on uh, for uh, almost three uh, years now. So um, the first slide that I want to present to you is uh, the slide on our simulation and data lab at the University of Iceland, of which uh, I am uh, one of the members. And as you can see on the lower uh, right part of the slide, there are also other members uh, and the head uh, being uh, Professor uh, Maurice Riedel and also uh, Gabriele uh, Cavallaro. Uh, but also we have other uh, PhD students like Surbi, Amer, uh, and Eduardo, and also now a uh, master students doing his master thesis with us, who is Liang Tian. Um, so the simulation and data labs are basically a structure, is one of the, of the many existing um, structures, labs, of the uh, National Competence Center for HPC uh, and AI uh, in Iceland. Um, so the idea is basically to connect, uh, to have a structure to connect uh, domain, uh, domain specific experts with HPC experts and uh, basically exploit the computational powers uh, and expertise uh, of these, uh, of the different worlds and merge them together. I also want to uh, mention that uh, we are co-organizing a school on high performance and disruptive computing uh, for remote sensing. Uh, which is going to happen actually here uh, at the University of Iceland uh, in the ASCIA building uh, at the end of uh, May. So registrations are now open and I think that it might be interesting uh, as uh, there are uh, lectures on several topics related to uh, for sure HPC, uh, like my topic I'm going to present today, distributed deep learning, but also to quantum computing, which is uh, which can be also a new uh, new thing for, for many of you. So that said, uh, so you already know the, the outline of the course and where my lecture uh, lies uh, in, in that. So again, uh, practical lecture 10.2. Uh, and what I'm going to present today are, are many uh, different, uh, well, actually it's the main topic of distributed deep learning, but presenting uh, many uh, different aspects of it from uh, a recap, as Maurice said, of the lecture 10.1 and concepts uh, related to, uh, in general, to deep learning, um, but also going through MPI. You might, you should already know uh, what it is, but, uh, um, but it's good also to, to, inter to recap some of those concepts. Uh, but then I'm going to, to move on to the, some theory of distributed deep learning and what it is and also the practical part of it, which is the, the framework that are used currently to, to do that, to perform distributed deep learning. Um, but I'll also uh, talk a little bit about one of my applications that I've been developing in these years during my uh, PhD. So uh, basically, uh, I'm starting now with a recap of lecture 10.1. Uh, and um, what I uh, what I want to start with is this uh, figure, uh, which is uh, actually a multi-layer perceptron. Uh, it's, uh, I, I'm presenting this uh, figure because it's a simplification. Uh, it's it's uh, one of the many uh, different possible uh, artificial neural network models. Uh, and uh, there are obviously others uh, like the recurrent neural networks, but feed forward uh, multi-layer perceptrons are, are basically easier to understand because you can see on the uh, that uh, we can follow the, the the flow of the data through this network 
looking at this figure from the left part where we have the input neurons, then uh, they, they go, the data goes through the, the, these connections, uh, these arrows basically between these links between uh, the input and the, uh, the input uh, layer and the uh, first hidden layer. And then we follow all, all our data that goes through this network till uh, the end, uh, till our uh, output layer. So the good thing about these uh, networks is that they can uh, be used to approximate arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary functions, uh, which is uh, very good because it means that you can basically uh, approximate uh, anything. Uh, and uh, uh, because you can also model uh, non-linear patterns if you use uh, nonlinear uh, discriminant function and, and functions and activation uh, functions. So basically uh, what it is, uh, this model, it's a way of uh, modeling this input output relationship between our uh, raw input and our uh, output that we, want to, that we want to retrieve. So um, I was mentioning, I was talking about activation functions. Uh, here I listed just some of them. Actually, there are uh, there are many others, but um, uh, so activation functions are uh, used uh, in the um, in the uh, neurons to let the information flow uh, in uh, or stop or be stopped, let's say, uh, depending uh, on the input. Uh, value. So here we can see the first one, uh, top left, is the sigmoid, which is a very widely used uh, uh, activation function, for example, used for um, multi-class classification in the last layer. Then there is the uh, rectified linear unit, which is used in for the hidden, uh, for the neurons of the hidden layers. But uh, there are many, many others. And again, uh, it's not the, the objective of this lecture to uh, explain what they are, but just for you to know that uh, there are many different activation functions and that they have uh, different purposes. That's, uh, that's the important thing to recall. So, but that said, so once we have defined our, let's say our simplified multi, um, our simplified uh, multi-layer perceptron, um, what do we do with that? So how can we uh, make it capture our uh, pattern in the data. So how can we can we make it extract the information that we need? So basically the process through uh, which you can uh, do that, uh, you can fit your model is called training. So uh, again, uh, let's focus on, a, on a, just one of the possible tasks, which is the supervised uh, training. So when you have uh, in the data, in the input data, you have a relationship uh, between uh, your data uh, and that are uh, labeled so that are that have a sort of etiquette so they they have um, a, uh, an associated uh, so they have associated they are associated to uh, a class uh, so the, let's say that we want to capture this uh, pattern uh, and uh, what we do basically what we want to do is to um, uh, make sure that we optimize the weight uh, and the bias values, uh, so the parameters of our multi-layer perceptron uh, using these uh, input data so that we can then extend our model on unseen test data, which is the final goal, obviously. So we do this uh, basically using this algorithm called uh, backpropagation. Uh, and backpropagation works uh, uh, basically, it's, it's basically an iterative algorithm that goes through uh, all the data that we have and using um, this concept uh, that uh, you can see in this formula that is the loss function, we basically go and check, go checking what the, um, uh, what is the, the distance, let's say the difference between the desired out output that we want to reach and the output predicted by our um, our model and doing so, and basically what we want to do, our objective is to uh, make this um, this distance the smallest uh, possible, uh, the little uh, possible. Uh, so uh, once this distance is small, the distance again between 
the desired output and the output predicted by our model, it means that uh, our model has been successfully trained. So basically just uh, having a look at this, uh, at the algorithm that is employed, um, which is called uh, gradient descent. So as I was saying, it's an iterative algorithm. Uh, and uh, what we do is uh, basically these. So we start off uh, with uh, randomly initialized weights. There are many ways of randomly initializing them, but let's assume here for simplicity that we uh, uh, draw the, um, the uh, weights of the model from a Gaussian distribution with the mean zero and the variance uh, and some sort and some variance. Uh, here it's sigma squared. So uh, we go iteratively through all the input data that we have, but we do so um, not just one point by one. We basically pack our data into multiple batches. So batches of data are basically collections, subset of our uh, training set. Uh, and we then compute the, the gradient uh, of uh, these, um, of the loss, uh, considering the, the batch of data that, that we uh, have picked uh, with respect to what? With respect to the uh, parameters of the uh, model. And once we do that, we uh, basically update the parameters, uh, basically the weights of our model. Uh, for example, uh, this is the simple case of SGD, so stochastic gradient descent with this formula. So the new weights uh, on the left of this formula are set to be equal to, uh, the, uh, to the initial weights minus eta. So this eta uh, is the learning rate. So it's the, the let's say the, the step uh, at which you are uh, performing uh, your update of the weights. So the smaller, uh, the, the, the slower uh, the update and the higher this value, the, the faster is the update. Uh, but actually there is a trade-off. So it's not that you can use a very high, uh, a very high uh, eta alert, um, learning rate without harming your, uh, your training most often. Most often. Um, and then you basically uh, subtract, as I was saying, this learning rate multiplied by the uh, gradient. And basically you do that uh, on and on uh, for all the batches that you have. So one of these uh, iterations is actually called uh, iteration also in the uh, deep learning community. Uh, and once you go through all the data that you have in your training set, you it said that you have uh, completed uh, an epoch. And actually you will do this uh, most likely for more than one epoch. So more than once you will go through all your uh, batches uh, of your training set to, uh, in order to uh, train your model. So yeah, as I, I was already saying what, uh, what an epoch and an iteration are. So again, epoch is you are going through, you have gone through the whole um, the whole set of samples that you have in your training set. Uh, and uh, the iteration basically is uh, the forward and backward pass. So this, uh, this update, basically this computation of the gradient and update of the weights just for uh, one batch. So try to, to bear with me and recall these, what these, uh, these terms means because I mean, because uh, they are very important to uh, what I'm going to describe later. So um, I also want to tell you to explain you what. Uh, uh, so um, let's assume that our our uh, model has been trained in the in the right way. What would happen is that you would observe something like in the in the in this figure here in the central uh, graph, let's say. Uh, so where basically you can see that this curve fits. Uh, the, um, the, the pattern of our input points. But what can happen if you train, for example, too much uh, your model, uh, or if your model has too many parameters uh, compared to the size of your data, it can actually happen that you are overfitting. So you're fitting too much your model and that's the problem. So that's the graph on the left, because uh, it means that uh, your model, it, it, it is fit so much to your data that it cannot 
uh, be deployed on unseen data without uh, having uh, good results. So it means that uh, you would have very poor generalization, we would say. So uh, it would uh, basically be uh, very poor when it comes to testing accuracy. On the other hand, what can happen also is that if you don't train enough your model, uh, you can uh, end up with uh, the underfitting problem. So a model that doesn't capture actually any pattern in your input data, which is not good as well. So uh, if you look at the, uh, at the right figure uh, in this slide, uh, you can see what happens uh, uh, when you train too much the uh, data, the, the model, sorry, on your data. And what you see is that actually, is that actually the, uh, while the error loss on the training uh, samples goes on decreasing, at some point, that is not true for the validation uh, and test uh, accuracy or test loss, depending on the metrics you use. And at some point it starts, uh, starts diverging uh, and we enter the uh, stage of training called as overfitting. And here that's an area we don't uh, want to enter because it means, as you can see, that our model is, perform is performing very poorly uh, on uh, data on which it has not been trained, which is not good. So uh, I finished here the first uh, 15 minutes of uh, uh, introduction and recalling of important concepts. And I will go on with some uh, some other concepts related, not strictly to deep learning, but uh, um, more to uh, other uh, other important concepts for my lecture. Um, so, uh, what is MPI? So, MPI message passing interface uh, is basically a standard for exchanging messages between multiple uh, processes. Uh, so we are here in a, actually in a distributed memory setting, uh, not in a shared memory setting. So we can, uh, for example, use MPI between uh, processes hosted on multiple uh, nodes of a supercomputing, which is very interesting for us if we want to, to really take advantage of all the nodes that we have uh, available. Um, so MPI is a, is a standard, it's not an implementation itself, but there are many implementations uh, like Open uh, MPI, like Parastation MPI, also Intel has its own uh, MPI, um, MPI uh, defined, let's say. Uh, and uh, uh, what it does is basically offering you, uh, providing you with uh, um, communication of, way of uh, ways of communicating uh, between these processes, um, uh, point to point, but also collective operations are possible. And the interesting thing is that you can basically implement whatever uh, kind of topology you like, stars, wheels, uh, rings, and ring in particular will be very important for uh, our for for one of the frameworks uh, for distributed deep learning I'm going to talk about. Um, so uh, yeah, as I was saying, let's assume that we have multiple processes, uh, multiple independent processes, but uh, uh, we want to basically exchange messages between uh, them. Uh, and we, we do that with some MPI uh, library. Uh, so for example, uh, there are the simple, uh, the simple operations like the point to point. Uh, so where one process sends, uh, sends its data, its message, just one other process, but there are, there are also the, uh, let's say the collective operations like uh, the broadcast, uh, which is sending the same uh, data to uh, all uh, the other processes in the group. Uh, but is, there is also the scatter, which is similar uh, in this to, to uh, the broadcast in the sense that it's also a collective operation. But the difference here is that you send different chunks of data to uh, different, uh, to each uh, process. So you are not uh, anymore sending the same uh, data here. And also there is in a way the, what you could see as the inverse uh, operation, uh, which is instead of sending data from one process, you want to collect uh, data from all the other processes. And this is called the gathering uh, operation. 
Uh, and then uh, once you gather uh, your, um, your data, you can also uh, perform uh, some operations with that. So let's say, let's assume that you, you collect different data from, from different processes. Uh, you can, for example, uh, perform the uh, co compute the maximum, uh, do the uh, product or also sum them, uh, sum the elements that you obtained. Uh, and this is a very important operation in, for many applications, uh, but also for our distributed uh, deep learning. That's a fundamental concept that is uh, exploited. So very important to, to recall uh, this uh, gathering and reduce uh, operation. So that said, so recalling MPI again is a standard, um, but it's not, let's say, hardware specific. So what happens is that, uh, uh, as you might already be aware of, uh, the till now the main uh, producer uh, of uh, GPUs for 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 computing. Um, for scientific computing uh, is uh, has been NVIDIA, even though things are a bit changing. I will comment on that uh, in the last part of my lecture. But uh, uh, so NVIDIA also defined its own library, uh, which is uh, uh, optimized for collective communications. Uh, so to sort of extend MPI on its own uh, hardware. So um, if some of you is, is fond of hardware, uh, you might already know that uh, NVIDIA provides, has developed some uh, hardware called NVLink uh, to connect uh, its uh, uh, GPUs, pairs of GPUs, and also the NV switch that basically uh, are uh, made of uh, multiple NVLinks. So nowadays, uh, the, with the new A100 GPUs that are not listed yet in this figure, you can actually create islands uh, of uh, uh, up to 16 GPUs intranode uh, using the NVLink and MV uh, switch. Uh, so you can, uh, you can basically create very high speed interconnections for internode communication, um, but you can also obviously connect uh, through, for example, uh, InfiniBand uh, or also with uh, a gigabit Ethernet, uh, multiple uh, GPUs that are hosted on, uh, on different nodes. Obviously here, uh, in, the, in the case of inter-node compared to intra-node, the performances would decrease a little bit. But anyway, the good thing is that uh, NVIDIA uh, created its own um, library to deal, I mean, to work uh, on, uh, on its own um, on its own uh, hardware, which is uh, which is good because it means that it's it's uh, heavily optimized and much faster than a basic MPI uh, when you are working on GPUs. And as you, as you might recall, uh, GPUs are fundamental for uh, deep learning, as uh, matrix multiplications are much faster on those devices. So that said, after we uh, finally are done with the, let's say the introduction part of my lecture, I can talk a little bit about what distributed training uh, is and why we actually need it. So uh, why all this hype on using multiple devices for training our model? So basically, uh, so if you recall the multi-layer perceptron, which is the simplified figure we have seen of a deep learning model, um, so you, you should recall that there are uh, multiple neurons, uh, each connected with some, uh, let's say, uh, those arrows that go from layer to layer, and each of them is characterized by some weights and biases. So basically the number of those, uh, so the amount of those uh, parameters defines uh, the um, size of our model and what we can observe year after year is actually an almost exponential increase in the number of weights uh, of parameters in the uh, deep learning models. So if some years ago, uh, when there was the, 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 the rise of CNNs for, for visual tasks, so we were talking about in the order of the tens of millions of uh, parameters, which was already a lot. For example, I use the ResNet 50, which is in the order of the 20, uh, million uh, parameters. 
now with the advent of transformers, which are a new uh, a new model based on uh, self attention uh, self attention heads, uh, basically the, the size of of the parameters of the models seems to be really growing a lot. And uh, recently, it has been um, it has been shown that there it has been actually shown this GPT three, which is not listed in this figure because it's my, it's newer, it's from two thousand twenty one, but it's uh, uh, the size of this model is in the order of the hundreds, uh, so one hundred and seventy billion parameters. And now people at Google at OpenAI uh, are also working in the um, thousand of billions of parameters, which is huge. You cannot train these uh, such huge models on your own uh, customer um, device. You need to uh, scale these on a very, very large uh, amount of devices. And in, in the industry, in this research, um, for these research projects and industrial project, they use clusters of thousands of GPUs. And so that's the sense of why we need to, to use some uh, way of distributing the training on multiple devices. So the other reason, uh, so the reason why actually models are becoming larger is because um, basically a larger, mod, larger models can capture uh, much, much better the pattern uh, hidden uh, inside our data. Uh, but the problem is that to be able to, to extract this information, you need uh, larger and larger, bigger and bigger data sets. So the larger a model is, the bigger the data set on which you train it must be. And if you look at the picture, at the figure on the left, you can see, for example, some of the uh, of the data sets that have been used. So when CNN were uh, basically born in the in mid 2010s, uh, they were working on data sets uh, of the size of the tens of thousands of samples. And now for uh, natural language applications like uh, language to language translation, uh, they are working with uh, uh, data sets of billion uh, not million, billion of, uh, um, of samples, which is uh, really, really huge. So I leave here for you uh, also a figure, uh, the one uh, below, uh, that basically uh, explains you uh, the relation between the size of the, um, the parameter of the model and the data set size with the uh, loss that you can observe uh, on the test set. So when you generalize the model and what you see is basically is that uh, it's true, we need to, to increase. Uh, so uh, increasing basically the, the, the operations. Uh, so here it's listed the, um, the, the basically the, the uh, floating points operations uh, per, per days here. Uh, and uh, um, basically with the increase of computation, with the increase of data set size, uh, the test loss decreases. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, what I, that's the reason basically be, behind uh, the uh, employment of uh, larger models. And also the reason why then we need definitely to uh, train them in a distributed fashion. So some more theory, uh, basically there are different ways of doing, uh, of distributing the, 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 the models and the training uh, of the models more correctly. And uh, the simplest approach I would say is data parallelism. So basically let's assume that you have, have, you have multiple devices, so multiple GPUs. You basically, what you do is replicating the same model uh, on uh, different on the different devices, but chunking your data and giving different chunks of this data uh, to uh, different to the different models, uh, and then uh, at some point during training, uh, basically um, synchronize it. Um, so how this happens is basically uh, these. Uh, so uh, again, you have your model, the same model on each of the uh, devices. You compute, uh, you, you do your uh, computation of the gradients locally for each uh, GPU device. 
which will see then, again, as I was saying, different input data. Um, and then uh, at some point, uh, an operation uh, to synchronize, basically to average, to exchange the gradients that takes place. Uh, and here is where the synchronization happens before uh, updating the weights and then restarting with the next iteration. Um, so this is, let's say, that was the simpler approach, but there is also another approach, uh, which is called model parallelism. Uh, and instead of giving different uh, data to each device, what we split here among the devices is the model itself. So till some time ago, till quite recently, this approach was, I would say, less preferred uh, by researchers compared to compared to uh, data parallelism because uh, it was much more complex to deal with, uh, and it required much more um, hand wiring, I would say, so much more coding and very complex one because you had to basically create your own way of distributing the model. But now things are changing a bit and I will comment on this uh, later. Anyway, still the, the model parallelism is, is more complex than data parallelism and introduces some issues, uh, especially when it comes to communication between nodes. Um, so there are basically two ways of doing model parallelism, which can also be intertwined. Um, so the first one is pipelining, I would say. So basically it means pipelining, partitioning the, uh, your uh, neural network according to the depth, so to the layers. So layer after layer, you basically pack some layers and you distribute them among uh, different GPU devices. Um, and uh, then that would already uh, do it. I mean, that would be the a naive approach and you would be already able to, to distribute, to, to do model parallelism. But what would happen with this is that most of your devices would be uh, idle, meaning they wouldn't be uh, working on computation uh, as, you, uh, as you feed your uh, distributed model uh, because each, each basically GPU would wait for, uh, for the data incoming from the previous uh, layers which are hosted on uh, on another GPU. This naive approach can be, let's say, solved using a more uh, advanced approach, which is again pipelining, uh, that tries to overlap computations in a way that, as you can see in this figure below uh, here on the right, uh, you basically um, give batches of data to, to the first GPU, which is device zero here, you process it, and then once it has been processed, it directly goes straight to, to uh, device one as in naive parallelism, in naive model parallelism, but then you don't leave your device zero uh, idle, you uh, straight away give it another batch to compute and so on. So you can basically reduce the uh, amount of idle time uh, in uh, the GPUs, even though, as you can see, there is still this bubble that can uh, can happen, and uh, uh, you have still to, to find a way of optimizing, minimizing actually these uh, bubbles, so the time your model is um, not exploiting the GPUs. Uh, but um, in model parallelism, you can also apply another form of parallelism, um, uh, which is not pipelining. It's called actually tensor parallel parallelism, and basically it exploits uh, algebraic operations in order to split the uh, sum of the matrix uh, uh, computations among different uh, GPU devices. Uh, and um, uh, basically here uh, I put a figure, you can look also at the link if you're interested into understanding the basics behind it, but it can show you how to basically uh, distribute uh, matrix multiplication, which is a very common operation uh, for deep learning for the computation of deep learning, optimization of uh, deep learning models. Um, and uh, this operation, this kind of par uh, model parallelism called tensor parallelism, again, is very, very important uh, for the um, scaling and training of large models like GPT-3, the one with 170 billion parameters I was talking about. So these are based on the so-called transformers. There are models uh, uh, that use exploit these multi-head self-attention. So a way of basically finding uh, by themselves 
the uh, correlations, I would say, between the input data. Um, so uh, transformers have uh, have been uh, have been surging a lot uh, in the in the last uh, uh, very recent couple of years. Uh, and uh, uh, if you want to know more uh, of, uh, of the concepts and theory behind the those applications, you can start uh, watching out this uh, YouTube video. Uh, I've put the link here too, which is Attention is All You Need uh, by Yannick Kisha, who also hosts a very, he's a YouTuber, but also um, ML, machine learning and deep learning researcher. And I strongly advise you to look at, uh, at these uh, at the videos by this guy because they're really, really interesting. But um, yeah, so also um, distributed deep learning is, uh, is just, uh, uh, I mean, it's not, everything is not so, uh, for, so simple. There are also uh, not just technical, uh, technical issues uh, I was talking about, but also scientific problems that one has to solve. And basically the, the main ones are, are these two that are in a way somewhat related. Uh, and it's that uh, it has been observed uh, empirically that once you uh, try to, you train your model on multiple uh, GPUs, basically uh, you use a larger global batch size. So batch size again is the amount of, uh, of uh, samples that you, use for training. When you use multiple GPUs, you're basically multiplying the local batch size that you have for each device by the number of GPU devices that you are using. And it has been observed, as I was saying, that once when you train your uh, model with very large batch size, actually uh, you can uh, have training difficulties so the loss can explode, but also a, a more subtle and in a way um, more problematic uh, issue is the fact that these models oftentimes do not uh, generalize well on unseen data. So one has to, uh, researchers have, have focused recently uh, in the last years on how to, to deal with this problem. Also here, there is a figure that illustrates the reason why this happens and is that basically the, the eigenvalues uh, of the loss function become much higher and this valley is much uh, steeper um, during optimization, which means that our optimizer uh, is having more troubles in finding the uh, global uh, optima of the loss function. And also here, there is a very nice paper by Schmituber, Jürgen Schmituber, researcher and professor at the Switzerland Supercomputing Center, which if you're into math, but you have to be strongly into math, you can uh, watch out. Um, so before finishing this, uh, the first half of the lecture, I would go through some of the techniques that one can use to, to deal with these issues. Um, one which is quite commonly used is uh, batch normalization, which basically if you go through uh, the, the formula is a, is a way of uh, addressing the, the, this problem I was talking about of the exploding gradients that, that cause the loss to explode. Basically what you do is that you uh, compute the, the mean and variance of the for each batch, uh, and you basically then uh, normalize. So divide by subtract the mean and uh, divide uh, by the uh, standard deviation. That's the way so uh, to regularize our input. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, I would say that for now, for the first uh, half of the lecture, I would stop uh, here. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Rocco. Um, that was a very interesting lecture. Very well, um, thank you very much. So we break here for a couple of minutes and we'll be back for the second part of the lecture.